Blog Talk Radio. Me chiamo apura kanu apura kaitnu neye akanpo nana son da me dinde o girapo kwesi rane mbata aka akwamumai amaruka etipi mu o girapo o giramai mu. Greetings to all Apurakani, Apurakai people, meaning Africans, black people today. It's Akan Po Nana Son Day, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion day. My name is Ojirapo Kwesi Ranem Pata Akan. Ojirapo, the Kwamu Nation in North America. Within Ojirama, the purified nation, Apurakani, Apurakai people in the Western Hemisphere. Let us say we thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. We have opened up the chat room. If you have any questions or comments in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised. Uh, We have to post a message right quick in the uh, link. Uh, We have Four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akanto Nanason, ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion on Joda Monday nights. Um, on Benada, Abenada Tuesday nights, we have Ojira, which means purification. We deal with ancestral religion in general, not just the Akan expression, but ancestral religion in general, how it impacts every aspect of our lives as Afura Akani, Afura Akani people. Ancestral religion, which we call Nanasom, Afurakani, Afurakani, or African ancestral religion, no matter what form it takes, wherever we exist, is Afurakani, Afurakani people in the world. In essence, the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual, we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts intentions and actions with divine order and through ritual we reject those things objects deeds and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts intentions and actions and thus realign ourselves with divine order so the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance these are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion we say that Ojira purification operationalizes Nanason. Purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating divine law and ritually rest, restoring divine balance. It is by this means that we execute our Amamre, our ancestral culture. Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people, our ancestral culture or way of life is to execute our divine function in creation as given to us by the great mother and great father, supreme being. We are cells within the great divine body of the supreme being, just as the cells within your great body, they serve the organ or gland of which they are component part. When they serve their parent organ, they are executing the function they have been designed to execute. They're serving you, the great body, at the same time. We, as Afurakani, Afurakani people, are cells within the great divine body of the Supreme Being. Our parent organs are the Abosom, Orisha, Vodou, Ntoru, Ntorutu, divinities, forces in nature. When we execute our divine functions under the guidance of our divine parents, our direct parents, the divinities that govern us, then we're serving the great body at the same time. We seek to align every thought, every intention, and every action, every moment, of every day with divine order so that we can properly execute our function. When we make legitimate mistakes, then we engage the ritual process to ritually incorporate divine law and ritually restore divine balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions so we can realign ourselves with order and realign ourselves and get back on track with executing our function moment to moment, day to day, and so forth. So, Ojira purification operationalize that process. So on that broadcast on Benada, Abenada, Tuesday nights, we have Ojira purifying concepts, purifying culture, purifying cosmology, the knowledge of ritual culture, and so forth. On Awukuda, Kuada, Wednesday nights, we have Egua Marketplace Day, 
showcasing Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, those who are serving the Afurakani, Afurakani community, also maintaining their ancestral religious values in the context of that service. On Yauda, which is also called Yada Abada Thursday night, we have Amain Sim, Affairs of the Nation, where we deal with specific issues that are confronting us as an Oman, as a nation, but specifically as Ujiraman, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. We deal with Amaniye, nationism, which is the purification of nationalism. We understand Amaniye, nationism, being rooted in our ancestral religious values. Our approach to nation building is a holistic approach. We recognize the reality that there's no such thing as a secular nationalism that's born of Eurocentric thought and behavior, which does not serve us, never has, and never will. We approach nation building and restoration from an Amanier perspective, a nationist perspective, recognizing the Omai, the nation, as a living, breathing entity governed by specific abosom, specific divinities, forces in creation, and we as cells within that organal structure, we are part of that structure. So when we work together interdependently like cells, working together interdependently within the organ of which they are a component part, but also drawing on the energy that governs that entity overall. The same is true with us as cells within the great divine body of supreme being, but when we're forced into or drawn into a certain region of the earth mother as we have been, because of enslavement and so forth, we freed ourselves from enslavement, but we're in this region, the western region of the Earth Mother's body. We've been drawn by our ancestresses and ancestors to coalesce in a specific region of the Earth Mother's body, to blend our ancestral blood circles in this region, to interface with the Earth Mother in this region in her unique expression, to interface with the abosom, the forces in nature, as they manifest in their unique expression in this region of the earth mother's body to take in the plant life animal life mineral life food as well as medicine from this region as it manifests in this region take take it into our body which transforms our structure in a significant way especially energetic wise from this region of the earth mother's body these things form within us a locative identity an identity born of our blending of ancestral blood circles in a region of the Earth Mother where we have acclimated ourselves to this expression of divinity in this region and incorporated it and absorbed it into our bodies, into our spirits, into our clan. So we have a unique expression of ancestral religion, a unique expression of Amaniye nationism, and a unique approach to uh, addressing all of our issues as an Amaniye, as a nation. So we deal with that on Yada Thursday nights. Tonight is Joda, Monday night. We deal with Akan Fo Nana Som, ancient authentic Akan, ancestral religion. First and foremost, because we are Akan. Secondly, because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan ancestral religion from individuals not only in the Western Hemisphere, but from those on the continent of Afraka, Afraikai who have been infected with white culture, pseudo-religion, white philosophy, and so forth. Those infections have been incorporated and woven into the fabric of the culture, and therefore when they express and promote concepts of ancestral religion and culture and so forth, it's an expression that's an infected expression. So we deal with ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion that takes us to our ancestral origins in ancient Kanat, the Khan land, which is called Nubia. At the fall of ancient Kemet in northern Kanat, some of our people migrated from the Khan land, Kanat, Nubia, to the western part of the continent and reestablished Akan civilization, the empire of Kana or Ghana, a couple of thousand years ago, was reestablished and we continued our culture. A thousand years later, because of Muslim invasion, some of our people migrated from that region and migrated further south, reestablishing Akan civilization 
in the Forest Belt and Savannah region of today's Ghana and Ivory Coast. Hundreds of years after that, some of us were taken from those regions and forced into North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Kekie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. So this is how we ended up here, from ancient Kana to West Afuraka Afurakai to the Western Hemisphere. However, we maintained our ancestral religious tradition. The Akan tradition in Suriname, South America, is called Winti. The Akan tradition in Jamaica is called Obia. The Akan ancestral religion in North America is called Hudu, from the Akan term Ndu, which means medicine, from roots, trees, plant life. It also means to become heavy with the spirit, to bring the spirits down through spirit possession and spirit communication. The same meaning it has in Hudu, North America, the exact same meaning it has in the Akan language, Hudu, the exact same meaning it has in the language of ancient Kemet and Kanat, as shown in the hieroglyphs, the Medutu, where you have Hudu meaning plant life, medicine, and so forth, but also meaning to become heavy with the spirit. It's also a title of ancient Nubia, the Undu land, and the people called the Undu people. So through ancestral religion, Hudu in North America, we were empowered and guided by our ancestresses and ancestors to wage war against the whites and their offspring and force the end of enslavement, taking up metal armaments as well as using chemical and biological warfare through root work, which we established the precedent North America for chemical and biological warfare. So we build on our traditions that actually freed our people. It was only those who maintained ancestral religious practice who freed our people from enslavement during that time and forced the end of enslavement by forcing the civil war to come into being through the Gullah Wars and so forth and the Hudu Wars and so forth. So this is why we deal with ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion born of our blood soul. We've maintained our ancestral religion for hundreds of years here in North America. We are not dependent on anyone outside of our direct ancestral spirit genetic blood circles for our ancestral religious practice. We're not dependent on traveling to the continent. We're not dependent on traveling to the Caribbean or anywhere else. We have maintained our Khan ancestral religion, including priesthoods and priestesshoods, root men, root women, who do men, who do women root workers, root doctors, and so forth, we have maintained priesthoods and priestesshoods in our direct spirit genetic blood circles for the past 300 years here in North America. Nobody from outside of here can come and initiate us into hoodoo, into being a root worker, root doctor, and so forth. We have maintained that here. So we have our own tradition, our own expression of our Khan tradition, which has been maintained for centuries. So we deal with ancient, authentic Akan ancestral religion and purify concepts, purify the understanding of who the Abosom are, the deities, who the Nananom and Samanpo are, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors and so forth, supreme being and so forth. So we're going to get into our topic tonight, our article that we published on our Ojira Sim WordPress blog, Ojira Sim, meaning uh, matters of purification. The name of the publication is Tuhuti, Ma'al, and Divination, From Kemet to Hudu. Now, some of the information we have in this article is some information that we covered in our three-part series on Ma'al, the male deity of divine law and balance. We also had the other two broadcasts which make up that five-part series on the deity Ma'al, the male counterpart of Ma'at. One of them is the male divinity Ma'al and his relationship to the female divinity Ma'at. The other one is uh, Ma'al and Ma'at, uh, Amasu and Amaria in Akan, showing who they are in Akan in detail and specific um, expression. So we have a five-part series. Those two plus the Parts 1, 2, and 3 of my All the Male Divinity of Divine Law and Balance, a five-part series that we did on Blog Talk. We published this article, which includes some of that information, but all of this is going to be included uh, in an upcoming publication, which will include this information plus more. 
in this particular article. We've covered some of the information we covered in the uh, broadcast, but we also want to focus specifically here on divination and Ma'al's relationship to divination. And we'll bring out some more information in the, in the process as well. So you can download this uh, article directly from the page. In fact, the, the WordPress page, but we'll put the link in the chat room. All right. We're going to go through this information, and then we're going to clarify these concepts. So it's Tehuti, Ma'a, and divination from Kemet to Hudu. So we have an image of a stele um, from ancient Kemet, and then next to that we have a sculpture of a monkey holding a vessel from the Baule Akan people in Ivory Coast. So as, as you know, you have about 11 million Akan people in Ghana, about 45% of the population. You have about 9 million Akan people in neighboring Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire, about 42% of the population. So collectively, there are about 20 million Akan people in between Ghana and Ivory Coast, one of the largest ethnic groups on the continent and, of course, in the western part of the continent, one of the largest groups from which we were taken and forced into the Western Hemisphere. So we show this um, ritual sculpture from the Akan people in Ivory Coast, the monkey holding the sacred vessel, and then we show this stela from ancient Kemet, and this is the stela of Nefer Renpet. So on this stela, we see the Ntoro, the deity, the god, Tuhuti, and of course Ntoro, mis mispronounced Netter, but it's Ntoro, vocalized, the same term, Ntoro, meaning divinity, is used in the Akan language for deity. It's directly uh, descended, and of course, the exact same term, Ntoro, from ancient Kemet. So in the stela of Nefer Renpet, which we show, we see the Ntoro, the Netter, the deity, the god, Tehuti, sitting in his sacred bark. Tehuti is the male force of divine wisdom in creation. He is the divine spokesperson or mouthpiece of Aminet and Amen, the great mother and great father supreme being, as well as Ra and Ra'et, the creator and creatress. Note that Seshat is the female force of divine wisdom. So Tehuti and Seshat are husband and wife, the male and female force of divine wisdom. We're showing this stella, you see Tehuti, the male force of divine wisdom, the deity of divine wisdom, sitting in his sacred bark. Now, when we want to know what is in harmony with divine order, what thoughts, intentions, and actions are or would be a manifestation of divine wisdom, we attune to the ntoro and ntorot, mispronounced netter and netert, but the ntoro and ntorot, the male and female deities of divine wisdom, Tehuti and Seshat. They're called Abe and Aberewa. In Akan, also Sankofa and Sankofa Wa in Akan, as we show in our book, we attune to them, to Huti and Sashat, for guidance, talking about divine wisdom, what's in harmony with order. The message they transmit to us, plant into our spirits, is a message which allows us to see the circumstance, event, individual, and or entity in proper context and how to move forward. This could be for healing a physical illness, a spiritual illness, a societal or communal fracturing, and more. When we say healing a physical illness and attuning to the divinity, the practical application of that is attuning to the divinity. Someone is ill. You're someone who is a healer or healeress. Someone becomes ill. They have an ailment. You do divination. You communicate with Tehuti and Sashat to find out what the person needs then they direct you towards the plant life necessary to heal the individual. So you go out into the forest, into nature. They direct you to which particular plant or plants you should pick at what time of the day, what time of the night, what time of the year, how to procure that, whether it's the bark or the roots or the flowers or the fruit of the plant and so forth. 
you procure that from nature, then you come back and you prepare it, whether you prepare it into a tincture or a pot or whatever it is, under the direction of the divinity, and then you give that medicine to the individual, and the individual is healed. That's a direct application. Learning from the divinity of divine wisdom, following their direction, going tangibly to procure the medicine that they directed you to, preparing the medicine in the fashion they directed you to prepare it, and then uh, administering the medicine to the person, and then they are healed as a result of that. When you look at George Washington Carver, Nana Kwame Afrani, as we call him in the Akan tradition, he talked about how all of his knowledge came from going out in nature early in the morning, communicating with the spirits of nature, and they told him what to do and how to process and draw and extract the properties from plant life and so forth. And, of course, he created hundreds of products from peanuts and sweet potatoes and everything else and transformed science all around the world because of his communication with the Abosom, the forces of nature. And we have individuals who do the same thing today. For example, in our Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival, we had our sister Ama Asase Ajay. She creates tinctures by that same process, by being directed by the Abosom to go out in nature and pick specific plants in a specific manner, prepare the tinctures and so forth, and heal our people. And she's been doing that for years. So when we talk about attuning to the divinities of divine wisdom, whether it's healing for a physical illness, a spiritual illness, a societal or communal fracturing, and more. Tehuti takes the form of his sacred achinebwa, animal totem, the habui, so-called ibis or crane on the skeleton, bird with a long beak and so forth, called the habui bird in ancient Kemet, misnomer the ibis, later called the crane in English and so forth, this is the animal totem form that he takes on this particular stella. Next to Tuhuti on this stella is the Un Toro, the divinity, An or Anan, in the form of his sacred animal totem, the baboon. He's called An, also Anan, in the text of ancient Kemet. He is offering to Tuhuti, you see in his hands, he's offering the Ujat Heru, the eye of Heru to Tuhuti. The eye of Heru, which you see people wearing it on necklaces and, and tattoos and clothing and so forth. The eye of Heru as an asumai, which is a term for talisman, not contradiction. This eye of Heru, this asumai, this talisman, is also a shrine. The left eye of Heru was injured when the Untoro, the god Heru, battled the Untoro, the god Set. It was Tuhuti along with the Ntoro, the goddess Hetheru, who healed the eye. So when you read the text of Kemet, inclusive of the so-called Chester Beatty Papyrus and um, in the Runu Pertinim Heru and so forth, where they're talking about why the black pig became an abomination to Heru and Set took the form of a black pig and shot Heru in the eye and, you know, um, wounded his eye and so forth, but then his eye was healed. In the so-called Chester Beatty Papyrus and the contendings of Heru and Set, Set gouged out Heru's eyes and so forth, and then there was a healing that took place in connection with Tehuti and Het Heru and so forth. So then the eye of Heru became a talisman, a healing talisman, the left eye of Heru. The left eye of Heru is the moon, while the right eye is the sun. So when you talk about the left eye of Heru, the right eye of Heru, you're talking about the moon and the sun. When the moon goes from full to half to crescent to new moon, and we're in a full moon now, uh, the, the moon, which is the eye, is being gouged out or injured. When the light returns to the moon and it fills back in day by day, it fills in, the eye has been healed or restored. The moon reflects the divine light of the Aten, the sun, the Atenit so that we can see in darkness. This is Tuhuti, the spokesperson reflecting the divine illumination of Ra and Ra'at to us so that we can see our way through blindness, ignorance, and make the proper wise decision which is in harmony with divine order. Then we show an image of the new moon cycle 
going from new moon to crescent to half moon, three quarters moons to full moon, fully healed the full eye, and then it begins to become gouged out. It becomes a three quarter moon, one quarter is in darkness, and a half moon, half light, half dark, then a crescent moon, three quarters dark, and just a sliver, one fourth light, and then a fully dark moon. The eye has been gouged out. The illumination has been gouged out. Darkness is natural, but blindness is a perversion. So if you're in darkness, that's not a problem. But if you're blind, then you can't navigate your way through the darkness. You need some illumination. So Tehuti wearing the crescent moon on his head, he operates through the moon. He's, he's also one connected to the moon, reflecting the divine light of the sun in darkness. So in the text, the book of the cow of heaven, when Ra, as the creator, decides that he's no longer going to rule on earth, and he says he's going further up into the heavenly realms, and he makes Tehuti his divine representative on earth, and he gives Tehuti the crescent moon and so forth. Ra, who uses the sun, the Aten, as a physical transmitter of his divine living energy, and the same is true of Ra at the Creatress. They're not the sun god or sun goddess, but they use the sun and other stars to transmit their divine living energy to us. When Ra, using the sun to transmit that divine living energy, when the sun moves further away, then the representative of the sun on earth, when the earth is in darkness, is the moon with its light, and it shines in the darkness so that we can navigate our way through the darkness, so we have an illuminated path. So we won't injure ourselves, so we can be warned when, you know, uh, dangerous animals are nearby and so forth. We can navigate our way through the darkness when we have some illumination. So Huthi as the spokesperson, mouthpiece of Ra and Rayet, he's receiving that divine light and transmitting it to us. Now, so we show that information. Moreover, the gravitational pull of the moon affects the rising of tides on Asase, Earth, the increase in water, an increase in fullness is akin to spirit possession, going under. Water is recognized in ancient Kemet and across Afuraka, Afuraika in Africa as a gateway to the spirit realm. The messenger, Ntoro, deity, An or Anan, proffering the eye of Heru, the moon to Tehuti, who wears the crescent moon on his crown, is part of an, of an oracular divination ritual. What you're looking at, at that, on that stella is an oracular divination ritual. This is something that Egyptologists could not tell you. This is something that we practice on a daily basis all across Afuraka, Afuraka, and in North America and the Western Hemisphere and Hoodoo and Juju and Vodun and so forth. So we can readily identify this ritual instantaneously. But an Egyptologist could not do that because they're not engaged in that practice. And a pseudo-scholar who believes they're Afrocentric or African-centered or involved in some uh, remixing of comedic spirituality couldn't tell you that either if they're simply mimicking what the whites and their offspring are saying in blackface. This is oracular divination ritual. The eye of Heru is the divination vessel through which Tehuti, the high priest, gazes to learn what spirit forces are affecting the issue in the physical world. The symbolism is critical to understand because it references a functional reality within the ancestral religious practices of our people, ancient and contemporary. So now we give the evidence. In the Akan tradition amongst the Baule subgroup of the Akan and Ivory Coast, West Afuraka, Afuraka in Africa, we find that the very same sacred monkey is the assistant of the Obosomfo, the high priest. The oracular sculpture shown here, which we show in the article, is found on the shrines of Akan diviners. So you see a little monkey with his knees bent, and he's holding a vessel. Just as you see, and he is, the, he is on the shrine, the assistant of the Obosomfo, the high priest, in the shrine house. In the same fashion, you see the stella of Neferenpet, the high priest, 
Tahuti is there, and his assistant is the little monkey proffering the Ai of Heru. In our Khan tradition, you have the Oposompo, the high priest, and then his assistant is the little monkey giving him the divine vessel. The oracular sculpture shown here is found on the shrines of Akan Divine. The monkey is holding the divination vessel. This is the eye of Heru, utilized for divination, including water gazing, so that the Obosomfo, the high priest, can communicate with the Abosom, the deities, and Nananom and Samampo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. The same is true in the Yoruba tradition in Nigeria, in West Afrika, Afrika in Africa. We find that the Orisha, the deity of divine wisdom, is Orumila, Suhuti in ancient Kemet. He had a pair of twins with his wife, Peregunlele. The twins were male and female and were called Edun. Edun is the term for monkey. The male Edun, so he had him and his wife, they were in certain stories in Yoruba tradition, they say the first twins that were ever born were born to Orumila, the Orisha of divine wisdom, and his wife, Peregunlele. Male and female twins were born, and they were called Edun. Edun is the Yoruba term for monkey. The male Edun went to live on earth with Orumila. The female Edun stayed in the heavenly realm. But the male Edun went to live on earth when Orumila went on earth and so forth. Because of his appearance, he lived amongst the animal kingdom because he looked like the, the monkeys and so forth. So they called him Edun. The male Edun became a priest of Ifa, a high priest. The male Edun holds the Opon Ifa, the divination tray, while the female Edun, who is actually the goddess or Orisha Odu, which is Ma'at, holds the sacred calabash of existence, which is the Igba Iwa Odu. We thus have the sacred monkey being an assistant to the deity of divine wisdom in Yoruba, a sacred monkey being an assistant to the high priest who invokes the deity of divine wisdom in Akan, and the sacred monkey being an assistant to the deity of wisdom, who is the high priest to Huti in Kemet. This is the same ancestral religion, the unbroken living tradition with the same deities. Now, one of the titles of the monkey, An, also in the Book of the Cow of Heaven, is spelled Aran, A-N-A-N, Aran. And of course, we show that to Huti is called Ma'al, Ked, he is true of voice and so forth, and Ma'al Sher in the Book of the Cow of Heaven is um, requested by Ra to come with him to the mountainous region, and Tehuti, Ma'al Sher goes up to meet with Ra on the mountain, and Ra takes the form of divine light, and he tells Tehuti, you are going to be my representative on earth. He directs him to take note of what's in the spirit realm. He makes him the scribe of the divine law, and he gives them, him the assistant the quote-unquote dog-headed baboon, the monkey, Anan. Of course, this is the origin, as we've proven in our book, Kuku Tuntun, the ancestral jurisdiction, that Ma'al, Cher, he who is true of voice, and Aran, the sacred assistant, became Moshe and Aran, or Moshe and Aran, or Moses and Aaron. Moses going up on the mountain to take, talk to the God in the form of divine light of burning bush. He becomes the representative of the God on earth. He becomes a divine scribe, bringing the law that was carved into the stones and so forth. Aram becomes his high priest. That's the beginning of the Levitical priesthood and all that nonsense. That's a corruption of the direct text of the book of the cow of heaven, so-called destruction of mankind, or the book of, heaven, of the heavenly cow. So in that text, the name of the monkey is spelled Aran. It's spelled sometimes An or Ana in different texts. So that's why we say one of the titles of the monkey, An or Aran, is Up Ma'a, meaning Judge Ma'a. Up meaning Judge, and Ma'a is the title. However, his primary title is Ma'a. Ma'a is the counterpart of Ma'at. They regulate divine law and balance in creation. In the papyrus of Hunesser, we see that Ma'at 
the female deity of divine law and balance is sitting atop the equilibrium point on the makat, the scales of divine balance. So we show that image, who never is standing there. We see the scales of divine balance. And the goddess Ma'at is sitting atop the equilibrium point of the scales. Now, the deceased person's heart is being weighed against the feather of Ma'at to see if it is light enough, not weighed down by this order, to balance out the feather. If it does balance out the feather, the spirit of the person can pass on to the ancestral realm to live in peace after a subsequent Quint trial with the deity Ma'al. We covered that in our part two of our that three-part series, Ma'al, the male divinity of divine law and balance, where you go through the 42 enunciations of Ma'at, meaning you invoke 42 deities and have them search out your spirit to prove that you didn't violate the aspects of creation that they govern. And once you pass that and you have your heart weighed against the feather and it's found to be in balance, you pass that trial in the dual hall of Ma'at, or the Usek Ma'ati. Then you go to the trial with the god Ma'at, and you go through an interrogation with Ma'at. And if you pass that interrogation, then he will ferry you across the divine river, the waters that are the dividing line between the physical realm and the ancestral realm, and then you can go dwell with your other spiritually cultivated ancestors and ancestors in harmony and dwell there while you're sojourning in the ancestral realm for the next hundred or more years until it's time for you to reincarnate. So we show that, we show her sitting atop of the equilibrium point of the scales. That's in the papyrus of Hunefa. In the papyrus of Ani, we find that it is the male deity Ma'a, also called Uk Ma'a or Judge Ma'a. He's also called An or Anan, in the form of his sacred animal totem, the monkey, who sits atop the equilibrium point on the scale. And one key for, with regard to linguistically, Anan can be Aren in Coptic, Anan in earlier vocalizations. Anan becomes Eran or Erun in the Yoruba, meaning the monkey. Anan or Anain in Amenshi Kemet, meaning the monkey. And you'll see in Coptic it's Enain. And then you find in Akan, Arenain means balance, equilibrium, equilibrium point, and so forth. So when you look in the papyrus of Anid, the monkey, Aran, or Anain, is also on the equilibrium point, Enain, of the scale. So in the papyrus of Unefer, Ma'at, she's on the equilibrium point, the balance of the scales, the female force of divine law and balance. In the papyrus of Unefer, Ma'at is on the equilibrium point, and he's called Ma'at, Judge Ma'at. He's sitting on the same, in the same area, the equilibrium point upon the scales. So we show both papyrus. And there are many, many papyrus. In the late period papyrus and in the tomb of uh, Pod named Twi. We have we show this papyrus as well in the late period. We also show the Ntoro Ma'a, the male deity Ma'a, in the form of Up Ma'a or Judge Ma'a working in concert with Tahuti, sitting atop the scales on the equilibrium point. So we show the late period papyrus and the tomb of um, both of them. Pa-nentui there. What is important, and even before we get to that point, is one of the reasons we show these two, the late period papyrus, um, and then also the one from Pa-nentui, which is also dealing with the, the Kanitu people, the Nubian people, and so forth. The reason we show these two in particular is because we wanted to show the relationship between Up Ma'a, Judge Ma'a, the deity Ma'a, in the form of his animal totem. Sometimes he's called Anan, which simply means the monkey itself, as, because that, that can be a Anan or an name, can be the term for a baboon, just in general, just baboon, an name, but also a, 
a name, but then also the title Ukma'a, Judge Ma'a. He's sitting on the equilibrium point of the scales of divine balance where the heart is going to be weighed against the feather for judgment. So he's called Judge Ma'a. But we show these two papyri specifically, or papyri and tunes and so forth specifically, to show them interacting. They're working together. Tuhuti in the form of the Habui bird, up Ma'a or Judge Ma'a in the form of the monkey, just like on the Stella of uh, Neferentet. They're working together. Tuhuti in the form of the Habui. You have Anand, who is Ma'a, in the form of the baboon. This is important because Tuhuti can sometimes take the form of a baboon himself but it's very easily distinguished in the text. So Huti can take the form of a baboon. Uh, there in some texts you will see Offset and Nebethet taking the form of female baboons as well. It's a sacred animal totem. Some people will assume that every time you see a baboon, especially in relationship to the weighing of the heart and the feather on the scale of Ma'at, that baboon must be Tehuti in the form of the baboon. This is why we show these two different papyri to show that these are two different deities working together. This is not an instance where Tehuti is taking the form of the baboon. Tehuti is in his form as the habui, the body of a male and the head of the habui bird, so-called ibis, and then he's working along with Ma'a or Judge Ma'a. Now, and there's one other piece with regard to that, which we mentioned in our book, Tuhuti, Sankofa, and Ifa, showing Tuhuti is the deity Sankofa, and Sankofa is Ifa in Yoruba, and Fa in Vodun, and, and so forth. That scale of Ma'at, the center pole of the scale of Ma'at, is called Fa Nkat. It's a deity who's called Fa or fa of the scales. And sitting atop that center pole, which is possessed by a deity called fa, is, in the papyrus of Hunefer, is ma'at. In the papyrus of Ani, is ma'a, or up, up ma'a. It's very important that ma'at is sitting atop the deity called fa nkat, or fa of the scales. Because as we show in our book, Tuhuti Sankofa, and Ifa, that in the Vodun tradition, Ifa is called Fa in Vodun, the deity of divine wisdom. He's manifest through the palm tree. The divine palm tree is a sacred um, plant totem for him. He manifests as the palm tree, and the palm tree is called Fa. And sitting atop the palm tree Fa is the goddess Badu, who has her 16 eyes that she opens and closes. Uh, for divination, and Legba goes up the tree and opens and closes Badu's eyes for divination. She's sitting upon Fa, the divine wisdom. In this representation, the deity Fa Nkat, or Fa of the scales, is the, the central pole of the scales, and atop the pole is Ma'at. Ma'at codifies the divine law. She's called Odu. In the Yoruba tradition, she called Badu in Vodun, G-B-A-D-U. Badu, which is Madu in Vodun, Odu in Yoruba, Ma'at in ancient Kemet, and of course, Amame in Akan, also Amaria in Akan, and so forth. So it's that exact same representation. And we go into detail about that in our, in our book, dealing with Tehuti, Sankofa, and Fa. And Ifa. Now, what is important to understand is that the role of Ma'at in divination and his role in creation in relation to Tehuti, as demonstrated in the Nefer Rintet Stella, can only be understood in our ancestral religious context. This is because we have a living tradition. In the Akan tradition, we have not only the cosmological and ritual manifestation, but also the linguistic evidence. So we compare Kometi and Akan terms. In ancient Kemet, the term for soul or divine consciousness, the deity dwelling in the head region, is Ka. 
In our con, the term for soul divine consciousness is kra. In Kemet, the term for the spirit, the divine living energy animating you. It takes the form of that sacred divine bird and so forth with the head of the human being or sometimes the bird with the burning incense in the bowl in front of it. That divine living spirit is called Ba. In Akan, the divine living spirit is called Bra. In ancient Kemet, the word for divine law is Ma'a or Ma. In Akan, the word for divine law is Mara. So it's Ka, Sol, Kara, Ka for soul and Kemet, Kara for soul and Akan. Ba for divine living spirit and Kemet, Bara for spirit and Akan. Ma for divine law and Kemet, Mara for divine law and Akan. That Ara at the end of Ka, Ba, and Ma. So you have Ka with the Ara at the end in Akan. So it's Ka, Ara, or Kara contracted into Ka. The Ara is an emphatic particle. It's like an exclamation point. The same thing for Ba and bara or bra. So, for example, the word for come, like come here, is ba. But if you, in our con, but if you want, want to make it an imperative, like you're putting an exclamation point on it, the way you, you don't just say ba, you say ba, ara, and you combine them because the ara is an emphatic part. So you say ba, ara, or bara. And sometimes it's contracted to bra. So if someone says, come here, you just say ba. If it's imperative, you like, get over here, you say bra. You're just adding the A-R-A at the end. But the root is ba. Just like the root of kara is ka. So, ba, spirit, divine living energy, ma, law. The same three words, the same meaning in kemet and akam. So we show that there. We talk about the emphatic particle. This is the key to understand because while the male and female forces of divine wisdom are Tehuti and Seshat, those who are the spokespersons for the supreme being, their divine declarations are codified into law by the male and female deities of divine law and balance. The Ntoro and Ntoro of divine law and balance are Ma'a and Ma'at. The term Mara is the term for law in Akan. It's ma in, it, ma in ancient Kemet, ma'ara in Akan, meaning law. It's the same term, ma'a, meaning law in Kemet. This is precisely why the monkey holding the divination bowl for the Obo Sonfo, the high priest, representative of Tehuti in Akan, the name of that monkey in Akan is mara, the same word for law, mara. In the Baule dialect, it, it can also be pronounced mara, so the word and the word in the Asante dialect is Mara, in the Akwamu dialect is Mara, but it's the same term. So you have the exact same deity with the exact same name executing the exact same function in both cultures, ancient and contemporary. The word for law is Ma'a, the name of the deity who's an assistant to Tuhuti, the God of divine wisdom, who offers him the divine eye that you look through or see through as an oracular divination implement. The name of that deity is Ma'al. The name, the word for law is Ma'al. And law is the codification of divine wisdom. The name, the word for law in Akan is Ma. The name of the monkey holding the divination vessel is Mara. And he's sitting right next to the priest who's the representative of Tehuti in the Akan shrine. Ma'a is the law. Ma'a is the deity who codifies the law in the form of a monkey with the divination vessel, with the eye of Heru, next to the divinity. You have to have all of those criteria to match them up. It's one thing to say the word mama means mother in one language and mama means mother in another language, so maybe it's the same language. That's not enough to make an identification. But when you have different specific criteria, you have a deity whose name is Ma'a. The word Ma'a means law. The name of the deity is Ma'a. He's the one who codifies divine wisdom. That's what law is, the codification of divine wisdom. 
law expresses divine order. So if you have divine order, which is, you know, proclaimed by the mouthpiece of the supreme being, which is Tehuti, the mouthpiece, then that proclamation is codified as laws that the community can live by. The desires of the supreme being is codified into law. So you have the spokesperson who pronounces it, communicates with the supreme being and pronounces, this is what the supreme being wants. And then the assistant of the spokesperson codifies that into law. So you have the word for law, ma'a, the deity who executes the law function, meaning meaning codifies divine wisdom, his name is ma'a. That deity whose name is ma'a is the assistant of the divinity of wisdom. That deity whose name is Ma'al, the word for law, also is proffering the deity of divine wisdom, the divine eye, which is what you look through, see through, so that you can see what deities and what things are taking shape so you can engage the divinatory process. You have to meet all of those criteria. So then you look in the Akan tradition, the word for law is Mara. The name of the deity is Mara. The deity takes the form of a monkey. The deity in the form of the monkey with the name Mara, which is also the name word for law, is holding the divination vessel. He is positioned next to the high priest, who is the spokesperson for the supreme being. That divine vessel is what you look into when you pour water into it in water gazing. You're looking into that eye, looking into that divine vessel, so you can learn what's taking place, what happened in the past, what's shaping in the future, so you can assist the querent, the client, in what they need. All of the criteria have been met to identify this divinity on every level by name, by function, by iconography in the form of the same sacred animal totem and the divination vessel that he is holding. This is information that no Egyptologist could give you. This is, no, this is information that some pseudo silly researcher who thinks that they're a linguist or you know, a specialist can give you when they do not practice ancestral religion. This exact same ritual figure with the divination bowl is something that we practice in the hoodoo tradition. So we say it's maintained in the ancestral religion, the Akan ancestral religion, maintained in our blood circles of Akan people in North America for over 300 years, which is hoodoo. In the hoodoo religion, we continue to have this mara, this ma'a sculpture figure, typically wood, clay, or fabric, on our shrines next to or holding our vessels of divination, adebisa, divination, which includes water gazing, peering into the gateway, the water, to the spirit realm for direction from our abosom and nananom and samanfo, the deities and the spiritually cultivated ancestresses an ancestor. We have that. We still practice that. I've had that divinity and that shrine, which is a kudu, which is a shrine vessel for water gazing, for over 14 years on the shrine. So when we look at the stella of Neferin, Pet, and Sisuhuti, and the monkey standing there with the divination bowl, any Akan person instantaneously knows exactly what that is because they especially the ones who are priests and priestesses, they're engaged in that function every single day. They communicate with that deity to who who is sitting there. They, They have that monkey literally holding that divination vessel right in their shrine right now. And people who practice hoodoo in North America who operate that function have the exact same sculpture, the exact same divination vessel, and are engaged in the same process. That exact scene that you see on the stella of Neferen Pet becomes alive in the hoodoo tradition because we are acting that out on a regular basis when people come to us for adebisa, divination. So these are the kinds of things when we talk about ojida, our purification, purification of concepts, purification of understanding, cosmology, and so forth. This is what we're talking about. We know exactly who ma'at and ma'at are, but we communicate directly with them via spirit possession and spirit communication, including divination, on a regular basis. We know the distinctions between Ma'a and Tuhuti, Ma'at and Seshat. Now, 
we also have to take into consideration this relationship, which most people do not understand, between the deity Ma'a with the representation sometimes of the monkey and so forth, but when they're spelling the name, sometimes they use the sickle, of course, that represents the sound Ma'a and the, the forearm with the open hand Ma'a. But then sometimes you see the, the plant or the earth formation, the earth mound and so forth. We show in our uh, document Usek Ma'ati, the dual hall of Ma'at, we're talking about the divine force of law and balance. When they're talking about the dual hall of ma'at, where you go and you know, become uh, judged after transition, why is it the dual hall of ma'at or ma'ati? Why do they have the symbol of the eye with the sickle near the eye, cutting or splitting near the eye? And then why do they have the elevation of earth or the plant as part of the symbol of ma'at? And sometimes that's, that's just the symbol of ma'at in and of itself. And why is there a dual hall of balance? In, in our article, Usek Ma'ati, in the article, Ma'a Ma'at and Judgment and so forth, we show in the upper region, as above, so below, of course, on two levels, talking about the spirit realm and the physical realm, but also within our physical bodies. The upper region, quote-unquote heavenly region of the body, is the head. Then you have the transitional phase, which is the neck, and then the lower region, the earthly region, is the physical body. In the upper region... If you're looking for um, the dual hall of ma'at or usek ma'ati, they show you exactly where it is by showing the medutu, the hieroglyphs of the eye with the sickle between the eye. What is between the eyes? They're pointing you, they're using, it's like GPS, they're directing you exactly to the space of the shrine of ma'at or the dual hall of ma'ati within your body. The vestibular system which is within the inner ear, is what allows you to maintain your balance up in the head region. The two ear canals are the dual halls of ma'at that lead to the two aspects of the vestibular system where you are able to maintain your balance, and it's on the inside of the head. But if you are looking at someone from the outside, you see the two eyes, and the sickle is in between the eye and undergirding the eye and so forth, if you go within the person's head, you'll find that location is the inner ear on both sides. The left and right um, aspects of the inner ear, that's the vestibular system or the balancing system within the body in the upper region. The ear canals are the shrines that lead to the vestibular system, which is, are the two dual halls of ma'at. That's where you maintain your balance. If you're leaning over to one side and leaning over to the other side, and then you restore your balance, you sent energy up to or a blood offering to the shrine of Ma'at. You sent some blood, which carries some energy. You sent a blood offering, a surge, to the shrine of Ma'at, the vestibular system within your head, within the inner ears and so forth. That's the dual hall of Ma'at where you gain, maintain your balance. That's in the heavenly region or the upper region. In the earthly region of the body, what is the center of balance or the center of gravity? That's around the pelvic region. This is why you see the plinth, that, or, which is originally an elevation of earth, that's spelled out as ma'a or ma'at. That's the center of gravity or the center of balance within your body in the lower region. That is that elevation of earth. That's where they show the kings and queen mothers seated on thrones on top of a plinth. That's around the pelvis and so forth. So that's the center of gravity in the, in the earthly region and the dual hall of ma'at in the quote-unquote heavenly region or the heady region is between the ears and so forth. That's the shrine of ma'at on top. The shrine of ma'at and ma'a on the bottom is in the pelvic region where the center of gravity is. But we need to go further because that's not the only reason that they have the I sometimes spelling out the term ma'a as well as ma'at. Yes, when you see the eye, sometimes you just see the sickle and the forearm with the open hand, with the palm turns up, turned upwards, or inclusive also of the, uh, the uh, plant or the formation of earth or elevation of earth and so forth. But then sometimes they use the eye. Sometimes they use the eye alone, and they'll use the term 
uh, ma'a for I, or meaning to see, but then at the same time, the word ma'a spelled out phonetically also means balance. So some people will say, well, uh, ma'a, when he's using an I, that's just talking about balance or sight or the God of sight, and that's all that is, and that's different from the word ma'a meaning balance, so there's no correlation, and there's no God called Ma'a, even though we show and prove specifically in the pyramid texts, the pyramid texts of Unas, the pyramid texts of Pepi I, the pyramid texts of Pepi II, Neferkara, the pyramid texts of Men and Ra, we show the male deity Ma'a in all of those texts. And there are references in those texts or um, um, representations of those texts where the determinative symbol of the falcon on the standard, representing that it's a deity, is part of the name spelled out. So we've shown that conclusively. So some fools were saying that, you know, Ma'a doesn't exist. Well, we proved that, if you listen to part two of our, our, our broadcast, Ma'a, the male deity of divine law and balance, we show him in all of those pyramid texts where he exists and he's referenced. In the oldest religious text in existence, Ma'a is talked about. Then we show in the late period text, the Nessie Men papyrus that comes at the end of the uh, dynastic period, the deity Ma'a shows up in the book of knowing the manifestation of the Ra. Talking about when Atem is talking about he was alone, he didn't have a place whereupon he could stand, he laid a foundation within and through the male deity Ma'a. It doesn't say Ma'a. It says the male deity Ma'a. And when it says the male deity Ma'a in version A of the history of, quote unquote, history of creation, then they have a version B um, as well, referencing the same deity. Because it says Ma'a, some white Egyptologists just said, oh, well, they're probably talking about Ma'at. And then brainwashed black people following the white Egyptologists just said, oh, it means he laid a foundation in Ma'at. So they just began to repeat that. They never looked at the actual text. They repeat it all the time. You've heard many people talk about the book of knowing the manifestations of Ra, the evolutions of Ra, the book of knowing the coming into being of Ra, and so forth, and overthrowing our pet. People repeat that text all the time. Right there in the text, it says he laid a foundation through the god Ma'a and then began to create. So we show that in that text. Then we show, in, of course, in the 11th hour of the Duat, the Shatun Duat, the male deity Ma'a in the 11th hour. And it clearly shows his name Ma'a. There are no missing hieroglyphs. Some clown said that it must be some missing hieroglyphs. It can't just be the deity Ma'a. It must be some missing hieroglyphs. So we're going to make up another deity to stick in there because it can't just be Ma'a. That kind of stupidity is manifest through individuals who do not research. And once they're exposed for being intellectual frauds and have been misinforming, misinforming people for some of them for decades, some of them for a few years, some of them for decades, then when they find out that there's a deity Ma'al that's, been, that's one half of all of the divine law that governs creation, undergirds creation, they begin to panic because they've been misinforming people for years and promoting themselves as some, having some expertise in the culture or the language and so forth. So when they see that Ma'a exists, then they panic. And then their ego kicks in, and then they want to pretend like the deity never existed because they never knew about it. Instead of just saying, I was unaware of this, I've been wrong all along, let me correct it, they'll rather pretend like the deity doesn't exist. So they'll try to hide the information or try to reinterpret it just to make it appear that the deity never existed just to preserve their ego, which is insane. So we show he's in the Shat Im Duat, in the 11th hour. He's in the pyramid text. He's in the late period text, the Nessie Men Papyrus. He's in the Runu Pert Im Heru, and he's doing the interrogation. And we prove that, of course, in part two of that series as well, and it's going to be in the book as well. But after you go through the um, judgment of Ma'at, in the dual hall of Ma'at, Usek Ma'ati, then you go through that extensive interrogation with the god Ma'a. And after you go through his extensive interrogation, a very extensive chapter, 
one of the most extensive chapters in the Runu Per Imheru so-called Book of the Dead, then you are, and you pass the test, then you can go to the ancestor realm. Then he will carry you across the waters and so forth. The dividing line between the physical realm and the spirit realm, and then you can dwell with your ancestors and ancestors in peace, those who are spiritually cultivated. So we show all of that. But for people who don't understand the connection between when the name is spelled with the I and the name spelled without the I, why would the word for ma'al meaning to see and the word ma'al and showing the I and the determinative of a deity and then the word ma'al without the I talking about balance? What's the connection between sight and balance? Is there a connection? Well, the Unsamafo point us directly to the connection. Once again, it's proven right there in the text. If you are engaged in ritual practice, you know this. Anybody who's been engaged in spirit possession knows this in an intimate way. But we can give you the proof even without uh, spirit possession. We can just give you the basic proof, and you can manifest it right now. What's the connection between... Ma'al meaning sight showing an eye, and the word ma'al meaning balance. The pseudo researcher would just say these are two different deities. They have nothing to do with each other. Ma'al meaning sight with an eye, ma'al meaning balance, totally unrelated. That's what the fool would say. Now, if you right now stand up, stand up, and then stand on one leg for 10 seconds. And this is part of a ritual practice that we do within our, with our, ourselves, with our children, and so forth. So if you stand up right now, just stand up like normal, and then lift your, your leg up, bend your knee, and balance on one leg for about 10 seconds. Now the next thing you're going to do, after you do that, put your leg back down, and this, this is a practice that we do, do it again, get back on one leg, balance yourself for about 10 seconds, and as you are balancing yourself, the thing you're going to do differently is close your eyes and keep them closed. Now, those who have done that recognize that when they're standing on one leg, they can balance themselves easily. But as soon as you close your eyes, then you start falling all over the place. Because when your eyes are open spatially, your brain takes note of the dimensions and the different things in the, in the room or in the space and the different objects in the space, and it centers you just like a computer would do. But when you close your eyes, you lose that spa- those spatial considerations, and then you start losing your balance. When the eyes are open, balance manifests. When the eyes are closed, you begin to lose your balance. And then you have to focus on the internal balance, which is down there by the center of gravity, which is in the earthly region, you know, near the pelvis. But anyone who engages that simple exercise, balance yourself, ma'a, ma'at, balance yourself on one leg with your eyes open, very simple. Balance yourself on one leg, hold it for a few seconds, and then close your eyes and see what happens you'll start losing your balance and it takes a minute to shift your energy and regain your balance and you have to really force and focus to regain your balance and it takes a while. There's a relationship between sight, ma'a, and balance, ma'a. They're directly related. You can see the balance. You can attune to the divine order. You can see the codification of law. When you see things in creation that are harmonious, you're peering into or you're, you're gazing into like water divination and so forth, you're peering into that divine order. When you close your eyes and it becomes internal, first you lose that balance. When you open your eyes, you regain that balance. That's the direct relationship physically and spiritually to ma'al meaning law and balance, ma'al meaning sight. This is why they show the deity with an I. They show him proffering an I. They, show, they spell the name of the deity with an I sometimes, and sometimes they just show up with the other Medusa without the I. This is information 
that the whites in Arrow Spring never understood until they hear this broadcast. This is information that misinformed pseudo-Afrocentric or pseudo-African-centered or pseudo-comedic scholars have never understood until they hear this broadcast. And notice that after the broadcast is released, just like some have done, some of them will begin to repeat it as though they've been teaching it all along. When you look back to Cuckoo's and Tum, the ancestral jurisdiction, we were talking about Ma'a being the male force of divine law and balance and Ma'at the female force of divine law and balance when we released that 16 years ago. That's when we first recorded the uh, audiobook version. We knew the information prior to, but when we uh, committed it to, you know, recording and published it 16 years ago in 13,002 or so, so-called 2002, we were talking about Ma'a and Ma'at then because it's part of our ritual practice. We invoke this male deity, Ma'a. We invoke the female divinity, Ma'at. We communicate directly with them through divination, spirit possession, always have. Akan people always have. Yoruba people always have. Ebi'i Beji. Uh, Vodun people as the Hoko divinities, the twin divinities. Ma'a, Ma'at, Amasu, Amaria, and Akan. Also called Abam and Amame, the twin divinities in Akan the balance of male and female. These are the same divinities, Ma'a, Ma'at, in ancient Kemet and Kana that we've utilized in all across Afuraka, Afuraka, Africa, and into the Western Hemisphere, wherever we have gone. We've been dealing with these deities and using the exact same symbolism of the monkey with the divination bowl next to the, the high priest or priestess who represents and is a vessel for the male and female forces of divine wisdom. This is an unbroken living tradition. It's not something that's manufactured or remixed, or reconstituted. This is intergenerational, transcarnational, spirit genetic inheritance, receiving this capacity to engage in divination and communication with these divinities, unbroken for hundreds of years in North America that goes into West Afrika, Afrika, and Central, thousands of years ago, all the way back to ancient Kanat, in an unbroken, ancestral, spirit genetic, transcarnational inheritance. This is why we can bring clarification to this information, and those who are pseudo-researchers cannot. That's the difference. Ritual practice actually engaged in a living culture. And a living culture does not mean that you go to some Yoruba events or you participate in some rituals or do what they tell you to do or show you to do, and you begin to imitate the contemporary expression of the Yoruba tradition or you go to Nigeria, go to some place on the continent and imitate the contemporary expression of the culture as it has been maintained there in that part of the Earth Mother's body, and then you imitate that over here, that's not an authentic expression. Authentic Yoruba tradition in North America is the Juju tradition which has been maintained for hundreds of years in the blood circles of those Yoruba people who were forced over here. And they continue to practice, but they interface with Onile, the Earth Mother, over here and her unique expression of energy over here and the unique expression of the Orisha over here and the plant life, animal life, and mineral life over here. And when they blended ancestral blood circles in the context, of interfacing with Onile, the Earth Mother, over here in this region of her body, and the specific plant life, animal life, and mineral life in this region of her, the Earth Mother's body, then they forged that Juju tradition or that Yoruba tradition that's unique to their blood circle here, and the manner in which they approach things is based on their proper navigation of life in this region of the Earth Mother's body. But somebody on the continent could never teach them only their ancestresses and ancestors who are Yoruba intergenerationally and transcarnationally could show you how to navigate life harmoniously in this region of Onile, the Earth Mother's body. So the only authentic Yoruba tradition in North America is the Juju tradition, which has been here for 300 years. The only authentic Akan ancestral religion in North America is the Hudu tradition, which is the Akan tradition that has been here for over 300 years. The way we learn to interface with Asase Afua, the Earth Mother, in this region of her body, blending ancestral blood circles, interfacing with the manifestation of the Abosome in this region, their unique manifestation in this region of her body, them showing us what animal totems 
There are animals over here that don't exist on the continent, like a possum, them showing us how to use possum bones for divination. An Akan person from Ghana can't come over here and teach you how to do possum bone divination. They can't teach you how to do cockle shell divination or seashell divination as manifest from this region. Our Nsamanfo, who are Akan ancestresses and ancestors who learn to interface with this region of the Earth Mother's body and the manifestation of the Abosom, the forces of nature, as they interface and, and manifest in this region of the Earth Mother's body and our blending of ancestral blood circles in this region and our consumption of plant life, animal life, mineral life from this region, which went into the makeup of all the cells of our body, including in sperm and ovum cells, which will produce children whose bodies resonate at the frequency of this region of the Earth Mother's body not in exclusion to what they brought from the continent, you know, genetically, but in addition to that, we have additional material that's transformed genetically. So we have a different energy complex that's unique, and only those ancestresses and ancestors who were spiritually cultivated who navigated their way through this new region and incorporated that ancestral protocol that they established with regard to the Abosom and the Nsamanfo in this region, they're the only ones who can pass that down to us through our genetic blood circles, our, our spirit genetic blood circles. They have that dispensation of Tumi or divine power, so-called Ashe in Europe, but Tumi and Akan, that comes directly through our Patriclan and Matriclan blood circles and the Abosom that govern our Patriclan and Matriclan blood circles. Only our people who have been here can show us how to navigate our way here. So the only authentic Akan ancestral religion in North America is the hoodoo tradition. Everything else is imitating what people are doing in a contemporary fashion on the continent. This is why there is so much missing, and people find things missing in their practice. And they don't know what's missing in the practice because they're imitating a contemporary expression manifest by their cousins on the continent, which fits them well but there's much that's missing for us over here. The only authentic voodoo tradition in North America is the voodoo tradition preserved in the blood circles of those Fon and Eve and related peoples who were forced over here hundreds of years ago, and they maintain that voodoo tradition. Not, we're not talking about Haitians migrating to Louisiana. We're talking about 100 years before the Haitians migrated to Louisiana our people were already forced over here and brought the voodoo tradition in their blood circle. That voodoo tradition is the only authentic voodoo tradition in North America amongst the people who were here. Those who came from the continent, maintained it in their blood circles for hundreds of years and passed it on intergenerationally in transcarnation. The same is true of the Wanga tradition, which is the Ovambo tradition, the Ngangan and Nganga traditions, the Fang and Bakongo traditions and so forth, these we maintained in our blood circles. These are the only authentic expressions. We have our own expressions, our own priesthoods, priestesshoods, and so forth. So that's the information we wanted to go over tonight. And, of course, we would also say that, which we can get into some more detail in another broadcast. We touched on it in the other broadcast on Ma'an Ma'at, but when we're talking about so it was the divination bowl or the divination tray, the Oponifa in the Yoruba tradition, the Kuduo in the Akan tradition, whatever the divination implement is. You also recognize that Ma'a and Ma'at codified the divine law. They also codify the divine law through the combination of symbols like Zeves and Adinkra symbols and Abramu, gold weights in the Akan tradition and so forth. These are codifications of the divine law of the supreme being. They become matrices or shrines. The medusa, the hieroglyphs, they are not just, it's not like English when people just write letters and so forth. And of course, those letters are derived directly from our ancient script. But the medusa are pictures. And those pictures of animals and deities and other things in creation and so forth, they are matrices for the energy of specific abosomes. So they are magnets for the abosome. When we draw those pictures or paint those pictures or make those sculptures, and those carvings and release, they're no different than a person, person practicing voodoo, drawing zeves, which are sacred matrices that draw magnetically the energy of a specific voodoo into the area, the ritual area. They're no different than adinkra symbols, 
when used on shrines and used ritually, each ge geometric pattern or combination of patterns resonates at a specific frequency, which draws the energy of specific abosome, specific nananom and samampo, spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of specific clans into that ritual space. So that's part of that codification of divine law as well. We're not just talking about writing books or writing treatises or writing laws down. We're talking about the actual scribing, drawing, painting, sculpting, and so forth, codifying through symbolism, through geometric form, concretizing divine law in geometric form, which becomes shrine. Okay, so we have a couple of uh, questions on the phone line. Okay, Michelle, we're on the phone line. You had a question or a comment, number 4342. Okay, that one, hold on one second. Okay, one of them dropped. Looks like looks like that call dropped. So if you were four three four two, you can call back. It looks like you dropped. Hold on one second. Let me see. Okay, Michelle, well, on the phone line number two zero eight one. Okay, no, number 2081 on the phone line. You had a question or a comment? Oh, sorry. My my line was muted. I'm, hello, Crazy. Greetings. What's up? Um, I'm not sure if you're aware. There was some videos circulating, and I was viewing one particularly by um, some debate by um named Zion Lex and some guy named Jahuti. And Zion used some of your material to um, bring a presence from what you've always been um, revealing for the past years in regards to ancestral and certain information on the script and the symbols. And I noticed, hold on a second. Um, I noticed um, a, lot, a lot of people watching that debate and from the other side, hold on. I noticed that um, I noticed a lot of them were talking about um, your work, and they always right. And one person asked a serious question on one of the shows. I'm not gonna name it. When they ask about where did you get your information or reference, they um they never noticed that um you all the work you revealed was already revealed already. So I'm not sure in response to the information that you come out. So what the real aim about, you know, discriminating your information? That's my question. Wait, say that last part again. Uh, One second. Yeah, I would say I, I would say um that um a lot of people are viewing your work and they are trying to say the certain things that either they don't understand or they're trying to look for something. Um, a bunch of like, yes. Yeah, so, um, that's my question. Hold on. Sorry about that. I, I'm getting too much incoming. Um, yeah. So my question is, a lot of them are trying to, I guess, try to say that your information doesn't really hold valid, and they they don't really conceptualize that what you revealed, you've been doing this for years, and it's not new information, but they take it some of your information and using it. The ones that don't find right. uh, understanding. You, you understand? And I'm not going to say the name right. of it because when, when one person asked a question on one particular broadcast, they asked them, say, all right, so what? The person asked, does this person use reference? And the person never did answer the question. They look at, it's like they're looking for validation from other races for the information that's already been stolen and revealed. So I'm not sure what is the end game that they don't understand that they they up here looking for. Are they looking for the Europeans' validation on some of this work that people are just revealing? I'm I'm kind of confused because stupid. 
Now that Shanice well, no, what it is is um, I saw a clip of something. Um, I saw a clip of you know somebody doing some kind of debate. I, I don't I don't I don't follow these individuals, and I don't have time to sit through a lot of the nonsense that they put forward. I saw one person using some of the work that we have. He was misrepresenting it. Somebody, you know, called himself a Hebrew and everything. He was misrepresenting, you know, the information because he really didn't understand it, even though I saw he referenced, you know, a portion of what we were doing. Um, I saw somebody else put together a little a little video um, trying to debunk the God Ma'al, and everything in the video was totally stupid. The, the ignorance of the individual is astonishing because everything he said was inaccurate and debunked literally by the work that he was referencing that I already put up. So I don't know who the individual is, but whoever they are, they're intellectual fraud. It was pure nonsense. Anybody who actually listened, for example, they tried to say that, you know, um, the deity Ma'ad didn't exist. Then they go to the Shat M. Duat 11th hour, and he's standing right there. And his name is right next to him in the text. So then they decide to manufacture an idea that, well, maybe it says Ma'al because the, rest, the other half of his name is missing from the text. So they ran and found another deity, Ma'ahes, and said, oh, he's really, that, that deity really represents Ma'ahes, which of course is, doesn't say that in the text, because they're scrambling trying to cover for the fact that they're intellectual frauds. Um, if they, he actually showed a picture of one of page of our article, Ma'al, Ma'at, and Judgment, where I show the image of the God Ma'al, the image of the God Ma'at. Right up under their feet is the entry from Budget's Dictionary for the God Ma'al, the God of Law and Balance, and the entry for the God Ma'at, the God of Law and Balance. But then in that entry, it shows you the actual references, not only from the Shat Im Duat or the Book of the, you know, Duat, but also the entries from the Pyramid text, or the Pyramid of Texts of Unas, of Pepi the First, Pepi the Second, Nefrakara, of Mer En Ra. So if people actually looked at the text he was actually showing on the screen from our book, they could go right to the pyramid text of Pepi, Unas, Pepi the Second, Mer En Ra, and see the deity Ma'a. He didn't do that in the video because that would have exposed his ignorance and the fact that he's trying to mislead people. And they just don't understand cosmology. So the video was pure stupidity. Like even a child just listening to that could recognize how idiotic that video was. It was laughable. So what really happens, like we mentioned earlier, people have been misinforming people for decades, but promoting themselves as some form of having some form of expertise. So when information is published by us or anybody else, that it turns out that it actually exposes the misinformation and the lack of understanding these individuals who are claiming some level of expertise in traditions exposes their, you know, them as, fa you know, phallus, fallacious, their presentations as, as fallacious and their quote-unquote knowledge as full of holes, then they begin to panic because then they're going to begin to lose credibility and lose the following, the little tiny following that they've garnered and so forth. They begin to panic and they seek to either hide the information or try to, try to put forth some foolish attempt at debunking the information which they are incapable of doing because the information is 100% accurate. They can't refute a syllable of what's in any publication. So all they can do is either try to hide it or put forward a, a pseudo-debunking, which only the ignorant who listen to them would embrace. Because if anybody went behind them, for example, watch this little silly childish video, they went behind that and actually listened to our three-part series as we're reading directly from the text, the pyramid text, and the Nesimim Papyrus, and the, you know, Runu Pertinim Heru, they will see exactly every single source that we use. And then we prove it in the Akan tradition, Yoruba tradition, Vodun tradition, and so forth. So what's happening is people are being exposed, they're embarrassed, they panic, and then they start swinging wildly like a drunk individual who you know, is fearing for their life, but they're imbalanced. In fact, the first 
broadcast Ma'al Male Divinity of Divine Law and Balance, the subtitle of that is Eradicating Male Emotional Instability. If you do not invoke the divinity Ma'al, who is a male force of divine law and balance, if you talk about Ma'at all the time, even if you're not engaged in ritual practice and you really don't know who she is because you've never communicated with her, but if you're constantly using her name on and on and on and on and talking the name Ma'at, 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 but if you don't know anything about the male deity Ma'at, then you're imbalanced. You're like somebody standing on one leg and not being able to balance. Until we invoke the male deity Ma'at ritually, then we're going to be imbalanced. And you will see that males who don't invoke the male divinity, Ma'a, they are emotionally unstable. So when they become challenged, their response is not to, a response that's or a reflective of law or balance or truth or integrity. Their response is to try to hide the information or, you know, delude the people into believing that the information is inaccurate and hoping that the people will simply listen to their foolish presentation and not go beyond that and actually investigate, because when they do actually investigate what we have put forward, it destroys these clowns. So the reason we don't even entertain them, because we happened to somebody mention our name in a comment on Facebook. I thought they were commenting on one of my posts about something else, and it turned out they were commenting on some post that somebody else tagged me on or something. I didn't know what, what it was. I got like 1,600 tag posts that I never responded to because I just don't allow people to post on my page and people are always posting all kinds of nonsense. So we don't do that. So sometimes I get a tag and I'm assuming somebody's, you know, tagging something else. And then I go to this page and they have this little silly video on here. And I look at the information is totally 100% nonsense. So when you see things like that, you understand what's going on. Every now and then you have somebody show up who's emotionally unstable. They, they are intimidated by the fact that the information that we put forward is stomping them into the ground, even though we're not even focused on these individuals, don't know who they are, but it's just the reality is truth is going to stomp falsehood into the ground. So then they show up and try to put forward some kind of defense to protect their ego, but it's no different than if you're in the car and you're driving, and you feel a mosquito flying around, you don't even have to look. You just smack it and smash it and keep driving. Or if you're on a computer and some little flea or some little mosquito is flying around, you just smash it without looking, and you keep going because it can't stop anything. It's just a, at best, it's a nuisance that's easily disposed of. And that's what a lot of these frauds are. That, that's all it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because a lot of them nowadays, it's like they can't conceptualize anything. It's like they're looking for the the Eurocentric side, but not really looking into what really what our people put forth. It's not going by what the Europeans said because everything they brought up is always what if they're talking about they they're so called experts, but they're not because they're not really understand what it is in the text completely. So they, they tried and many to of them haven't the read Well, many of them yeah. have not read these texts. They've read a couple of things, but you, you look in the Runu Pert and Haru, they've never looked at the interrogation dealing with the God Ma'al. They don't know who he is. They don't know what his titles are. They've never looked in that. They've never really looked at the pyramid texts. They've never really read through them. They've never really studied the coffin text, and they can't show the connection between them and the living culture today and these exact same deities the exact same names, with the exact same functions in creation, and the exact same ritual practices, they have no knowledge of that whatsoever. So they're really bankrupt with regard to experience. And they they can look beyond the text and can't even, they can see a text right in front of them, and they don't know what they're looking at. They can look at, for example, at the Stella of Neferin Pet with the, you know, monkey, Aran, proffering the eye of Heru to Tuhuti. They, They can't see what's happening. But somebody, like we said, who's our Khan or somebody in the Yoruba tradition and so forth, as soon as they see that, they know exactly what's happening because they do that every single day. And they literally have that monkey with the divination bowl sitting on their shrine right across the room when they're actually looking at this, this um, image. That, that tradition never stops. 
So these people have no experience, and they, their intellectual capacity is like that of a mosquito. So they just get smashed, and we just keep moving. It's, it's that simple. All right. All right. Thank you for answering my question, Quasi. Madase. Okay. What's up? Madase. Okay, so we got – hold on one second. One more call on the phone line. Give me chill on the phone line number 0217. You had a question or a comment? Yes. Um, good night, Brother Crazy. Um, you mentioned the, um, the palm is a totem for um, the beauty. And almost to the end of um, your um, you were brought up tonight that, that um, um, when when that is used. Well, hold on. Your, your um your sound was kind of going in and out a little bit. Okay, let me turn up the phone a little bit. Just a second. Uh, okay. All right. Is okay. this better? Uh, a little bit better. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. You mentioned that the um the palm is a uh, totem for uh, Tuhuti, and when uh, certain totems are used ritually um, by Afro-Kanyu, um, that uh, some of the energy um, of the God, would you say that, um, because the palm is like a common item, the palm and palm products, like the palm brooms and um, wine that is used at ceremonies, et cetera. Would you say that um, just in the common um, day-to-day things and not just a ritual practice, that that also um, summons the energy of Jehudi? It can because um, we, and it's not just Tehuti, it's a shot as well. So you'll see that if you look in the book, the Tehuti book on Tehuti Sankofa Fa Fa, and we're showing you know, that that's the same divinity in Akan, Yoruba, Eve, Faun, and so forth. Uh, Tehuti is using the, the palm frond. Uh, Seshat is using the palm frond. Her, her headdress is the palm tree. In Akan tradition, you know, Abe is the palm tree, and Abediwa is Seshat. And then Yoruba, you have the palm nuts used for Ifa divination, and the palm tree is Fa in Vodun, and Badu is sitting on top of the palm tree and all of that. So yes, when we're using different parts of different plants, and one of the, sometimes one of the reasons that we would use those sacred plants in our everyday mundane practices is to keep us focused, and it, be, it becomes like a, a miniature shrine, so to speak, that carries the residual energy of the abosom. So whether it's a palm okay. tree or some other, you know, plant totem and so forth, it's constantly keeping us, you know, um, focused on that kind of energy complex. Because, okay. I mean, I know um, Caribbeans especially, they use the palm to do sweet jokes. I mean, it's sweet PR, they use it, you know. I mean, you know, other products made with the palm, of course, that are just um, used regularly. But until um, your broadcast, I never really thought of it in, you know, in the same sense, really. Since it's such a common, you know, item. Right. And then you also palm leaf, there's palm leaf divination as well. So okay. there are a number of different ways that it's utilized. Absolutely. Wait, you went out, you were going out, you were going in and out again a little bit? Sorry. Okay. You mentioned that the ibis bird. Um, it's also a sacred totem for Tehuti. What about the um, giraffe? Um, is that in any way um, related? Uh, you mean related to Tehuti? Yes. Now, with the giraffe, it could be. Now, I, I would have to check because there are there is some symbolism, for example, in Kemet uh, with the giraffe. It could be connected to that simply because it's a it's a relationship between that animal and you know the difference between uh, certain kinds of palm trees where the uh, the trunk is very 
tall and then the, the you know the leaves are on the top, the foliage is on the top, depending on what kind of palm tree it is. And the kind of animal that could reach that um will be the giraffe. But then you also have the monkeys who could climb up and, you know, grab the you know, foliage and everything else. So that's something um I can look into and that's something for all of us. We can check that out. Hmm, interesting. And one other one other question about totems. What about the turtles? Okay, so there's, it, it depends on the group. So, for example, you have it's Achecheria in Akan, which is, which is the turtle or the tortoise. It's connected to certain um, Ejaboso, Patrick Clan divinities. You have the tortoise associated with um, Hapi, the river, so-called now, the river divinity in ancient Kemet. Um, you have the tortoise sometimes uh, connected to Shango in the Yoruba tradition, the shell of the tortoise being used for divination. So it depends on the group. It depends on the clan and what relationship they have with the animal. But, but, but it is the turtle, quote-unquote, tortoise, does exist in the various different traditions. It is a sacred animal totem, but it depends on the relationship the people have cultivated with a specific divinity or an ancestral clan and how they direct that animal to be, you know, one of those animal totems for them. Oh. Oh, thanks a lot for answering my question. Okay. We appreciate the call. And it's interesting about the tortoise piece because we did a broadcast on Hapi, the male divinity of the river and so forth, and we were showing specific things, for example, the White Snow Spring will try to put forth the fallacy that Hapi is dealing with um, uh, transgender, transgenderism and, and, you know, being hermaphrodite because he has, quote, unquote, large breasts and a big stomach and that's supposed to be a pregnant woman and all this other nonsense. Or some people try to say he was originally a female divinity and then with patriarchy he was changed into the male, which is stupidity. You have Hapi or Set and Hapi Met, Hapi of the South and Hapi of the North, the male now divinity. The female divinities of the inundation are Merit Shema and Merit Met, Merit of the South and Merit of the North, so there's a balance of the male and female. We show Hapi, the reason he's shown with the bigger belly and all of the fat and everything is because of that notion of hibernation. And we went into detail about that whole process of hibernation. Just like bears go and hibernate, hibernate and they take on a great deal of fat so that they can hibernate and spend, you know, a number of months, quote unquote, sleeping or hibernating, and they can use that fat that they built up to nourish themselves while they're in that state. In the same fashion, they talk about in the text, uh, Hapi after flooding the lands and so forth, he goes into hibernation for a period for a number of months. But he has to become, quote, unquote, fat first. Then he can go into hibernation uh, for a number of months until it's time for him to, you know, manifest once again. We talked about that notion of hibernation with bears. Another portion of that, talking about that estivation process with crocodiles where they engage in a, quote, unquote, hibernation state where they get in some mud and they stay there for a number of months without moving, without eating, and so forth. But then you also have this notion of the tortoise, which we'll include in that upcoming piece as well, hibernating or withdrawing into that shell as well. So that's uh, this relationship between, this is why there's a relationship between uh, Tehuti, I'm sorry, Hapi um, and the tortoise as well. So we're going to get into that. And the tortoise shell being used uh, for divination as well. But again, it has to do with different groups, like in our con tradition, certain Ejabosom, Patrick Clan deity groups, have the tortoise for animal totem. Some in, have different, uh, in, depending on different ethnic groups on the continent, wherever we are, Chokwe and Bakango, wherever we are, the relationship that they've built with the divinities and how those animal totems are used are unique to the group. So it depends on, your relationship depends on what group you're from. All right.
Okay. In fact, so, and speaking of that, since she brought that up, and that's a good segue, as a matter of fact, that whole notion of hibernation, the period, the time period of Hapi, he is, the, of course, the one that has the vessels that pours water into the river, which causes it to swell and so forth. But the time period of Hapi, which the White Snarl Spring calls the water bearer or Aquarius, begins around February 16th. That's that time period of Hapi in the astronomical zodiac, the real zodiac. It begins around February 16th. In the tropical zodiac, it's, it's, you know, it's earlier, but in the astronomical zodiac where the actual constellations actually are, it begins around Fe- February 16th. That's the time of Hapi and Merit. And this is why we're having our hibernation retreat, the Hapi Merit retreat, hibernation retreat in a number of weeks, Fe- February 16th through the 19th. Um, it's going to be in, on Edisto Island, Edisto Island in South Carolina, one of the Gullah Islands. So as we said earlier, we had four spaces that opened up because of some last-minute uh, cancellations. Two of those spaces have been taken, so we have two spaces left. So for those of you who would like to join us on the retreat, February 16th through the 19th, what it is, you would arrive February 16th on Friday evening or whatever. Um, the sessions will take place on Saturday and Sunday. Of course, you'll leave Monday morning. So, but it's going to be at Edisto Island. We'll have our sessions, Oberima Afrakani Manhood, based on the Oberima book, that training session and workshop. I'll be conducting that session with the brothers. Um, Dr. Ia Ajua, she'll be conducting the session, Obatai Afuraikani Womanhood with the sisters, based on the book, Obatai Afuraikani Womanhood. So we are building not only Afuraikani Manhood and Afuraikani Womanhood for Ujiramai, the purified nation, Afuraikani, Afuraikani people in the Western Hemisphere, but people leaving that retreat will be able to uh, conduct those sessions and share that information with the community. We'll also have joint sessions, Batasa Satem, as well as another joint session, and the sessions will be in the morning and early afternoon. Then the late afternoon and evening, people will be able to go off, you know, on their own and explore the island and just vacation. So all the activities will be on, you know, the training will be on Saturday and Sunday, morning and early afternoon. Um, arrival is any time on Friday when you decide to do that and, and you're leaving Monday morning. So two spaces left. You can go to our Hapi Metairie page to secure your space. Um, it's only, you know, a, a month and a half away, just six weeks away. So the first come, first serve. And also, we talked about this on Yaoda on Thursday night on Amain Sim, right before the pseudo holiday and so forth. We were talking about the Black Swan Life T-shirts. We had a couple of people who ordered, so may I say we appreciate um, you know, a couple of people will order as well, but we're still trying to get to that, that level, that number, so we can order in bulk the first order of the T-shirts. So go to our Black Swan Life page. You can order a T-shirt for your sister or your wife or your daughter or your niece or your aunt or your mother, grandmother, and so forth. We're promoting that standard of beauty of the Afurai Kaini woman rooted in our ancestral culture, not white culture and so forth. We're promoting that um, imagery of Het Heru and Bast and so forth. We have Ames Nefertari, great queen mother on the shirt. Of course, the black swan, the Sankofa symbol, the sacred waters and so forth, and the Medutu laying it out. We have the cosmology laid out on the website so you can see that. But this is part of a movement to restore our consciousness as Afurakani and Afurakani people. So please support that. Um, as soon as we can get to that number, we you know, we would like to go and print out the first batch, like by tomorrow or Avukuda Wednesday. So if you have not had a chance to order, the shirt is $20, $25. Um, or you can order more than one as a gift for, you know, a daughter or a niece or a wife or whatever it is. So yet I'll say for those who have ordered, we've had about 10 people order so far. We've released the 
uh, information and the video and the website and so forth. Um, last, well, not last month, but actually in November. November 6th is when we release everything. We've had about 10 orders in the past uh, eight weeks. So we just need some support with that, and we'll be able to launch this Black Swan Life movement. So, yet I say we thank you for tuning into the broadcast. Yebeshi Abio. We will meet again. What's up?